Good morning. Uh, it's Sunday here in Medford. After our morning masses, we are gathered today, the week after Pentecost, to celebrate the Feast of the Most Holy Trinity, the most difficult topic on the calendar to preach about. Uh, I say it's difficult for two reasons. One is uh, because it's so foreign to our own experience. And secondly, uh, even by analogy, my mind cannot, at least my mind cannot wrap itself around uh, the teaching of the Trinity. I have to accept it on faith. And also, as I, I shared with our community, there are some doctrines of the church which we can delve more deeply into uh, with the academic discipline or the gift of our intellect. But there's a short list of teachings that a wise man once said can only be known by the heart. And I personally think chief among them would be this doctrine, the Most Holy Trinity. Uh, now, to begin with, I know of various childlike analogies that have been given by saints in the past, and they are suitable to share with children. Uh, for instance, the famous three-leaf clover, three leaves yet one plant, with St. Patrick. And we can think of St. Joseph of Cupertino, who took a blanket on one occasion and folded it into thirds, and that was his stab at the Trinity in a simple visual way. Uh, St. Cyril of Cyril and Methodius, who described the sun in the sky as an image of the Father with the light coming from the sun as the S-O-N, as Jesus, the sun, and as the heat coming from the sun the, being the Holy Spirit. And there are many others, but as I say, in my view, in the final analysis, those are fit for those new to the faith or those who are children or childlike. At a certain point in maturing in the faith, however, those uh, images all fall way short of the mystery of this doctrine in my personal view. And just so you know, in case someone <laughs> decides to write me, yes, I'm also familiar with the writings of St. Athanasius and how he tried to delve into this. Uh, St. Augustine, his writings are quite famous. He, uh, he thought that if we are uh, made in the image and likeness of God and God is Trinity, then there must be some way that we can describe our human nature as Trinitarian and, and various Saints and Catholic philosophers have taken a stab at that by sharing that, uh, you know, it might have something to do with the memory and the ego and et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> I cannot. Um, I can't follow that line of thinking. It doesn't ultimately help me. Um, and it certainly doesn't help me with the bigger question, which I'm wired to always think about since I'm a practical person. And that is, so what? <laughs> What does this have to do with my life? But that all being said as a prologue, let me also take a step back as I did this weekend by first reminding people what we can know of God just from our mind alone. And the best source that I can think of to touch upon this is uh, a book I'm currently rereading uh, called Mere Christianity. It's a classic by C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis made a journey from atheism to Christianity. And if I tried to classify his journey, I would say it was an intellectual one. That's not true of everybody. Some people are just hit by grace. Some people are inspired by a friend or the witness of a saint or various other things, a miracle. But in his case, it was a philosophical journey. He fought his way into Christianity the best he could. And because he was an articulate writer and a clear thinker, at one point, a local radio station asked him if he could try to put into words his thought process, how he made that journey in, in the hopes that maybe it would help some other people. And so he did. And in uh, those, those series of talks from the radio became this book, Mere Christianity. In the first and second book, he talks about um, the only two pieces of evidence he felt he had and uh, he reasons that this might be true of all people, but certainly from his own personal perspective, two pieces of evidence, he called them uh, outside information and inside information. The outside information, he said, was just observing creation, 
taking a fair look at it without bias, without allowing your own personal life experiences to, to poison the process. Just look with a pure mind and witness and draw conclusions. And he said the conclusion he draws is that the universe is not chaotic. It's not random. It's governed by principles and laws, uh, scientific laws. It's knowable and it's consistent. In other words, it's ordered. It's logical. And he said he, it was enough evidence for him to conclude that the universe did not happen by some random accident. There has to be an intelligent designer. And he thinks anyone could arrive at that if they did not have a biased set of opinions to start with reflecting on that. However, he added this thought, which I found fascinating. He said, yes, we could conclude if that's all we knew of God, his thumbprint from creation, we would say he was logical and ordered. But we would also likely be wise to fear him, to uh, uh, sort of potentially be in terror of him. Because he said, if you observe nature, nature is cruel. I like to watch survival shows and they are a really great reminder that, you know, in one moment you see a picturesque scene, a wonderful photograph, but if you had to live out there for 30 days, you realize just how tough it is. And you, you turn on the nature channel and see the food chain in action. You see an animal, eat another animal, eat another animal. Um, and nature is not so warm and fuzzy. It's actually quite rough. Um, so if that's a reflection of the God, we are to worship, then I think we would be at a great distance from him and, and we would be wisely in terror of him. He said the inside information, however, changes that a bit and that gives him a little more hope. That is the conscience. Uh, he said it, we all have this universal experience that at some point in our life or very often for most people where, for instance, you think about doing something and you know it's wrong. You tell yourself in your mind, oh, this is naughty. This is going to break the rules. This is not how I was raised. My parents would be mad at me if I did this, whatever. You just have a sense. Uh, I want to do something, but I know it's wrong and I'm going to do it anyway. Or maybe I will listen to that voice and, and avoid it. Or contrarily, he said, sometimes it might take the opposite form. It might be I look at a situation and I say, you know, a heroic person, a courageous person, a good person would do X, but I don't want to get involved or I'm feeling lazy today and I don't have energy for that and I want to avoid it. And we feel bad because we don't rise to some higher mark. He said by evidence of those types of conversations within ourselves, we have proof that there is a God because we're arguing with a measure that clearly does not come from us. If we're thinking of breaking it, if we disagree with it, if we struggle with it, it's not of our own design. It's coming from some other standard. We know as Christians, it's God who's written his law upon our heart. So that's the other thing, the, the fingerprint of creation and this law upon our heart. But he said this proof, on the other hand, is more convincing, first of all, because it is inside information. Uh, I don't have to observe it from afar. I feel it in my heart and in my soul. But secondly, because he said our conscience tends to coach us toward more compassionate, more loving, uh, higher virtue, uh, a higher response, a, a high standard. And if the God that exists has put that on our heart, then we have hope that our God is also compassionate and loving, perhaps. But it's quite vague. And for some people, their conscience is also not a sharp instrument. It's not finely tuned. So it would be quite vague. And I, I've been wondering this week, uh, this is a kind of philosophical question I would have loved to think about as a kid out fishing on the uh, stream somewhere. What would religion look like if that's all we knew of God? That he made creation in the way C.S. Lewis says, in a fearsome way, and perhaps in a kind of cruel way, and that he's vaguely put this kind of law on our heart. I know it would not look like our worship today, that's for certain, but everything else we know of God, and there's a 
thankfully a longer list than that. It comes from divine revelation. We would not be able to know it unless God chose to reveal it to us. These two things I mentioned already, we could say, we could argue he revealed those as well. He left a sign of himself, a fingerprint. He left his law. But these other things, uh, we couldn't even guess at. And foremost of all on the list would be the doctrine of the most holy trinity. You couldn't dream it up in your wildest imaginings, a God who is one and simultaneously three persons. That is bizarre because there's really nothing in nature that corresponds to that, um, that would lead us to that kind of a wild idea. Um, and we see it everywhere, by the way, in scripture. It's vaguely in the Old Testament, uh, in hidden ways, but it is there. For instance, in the creation story, in the first chapters, we see a God who's creating the universe. We presume from the story that's God the Father. He speaks words and things come to be. The word that he's speaking is the Son, the word made flesh, and then he breathes upon his creation. The word is ruah, which is the same word for spirit. So in a very hidden, camouflaged way, there's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit together. You can think of Abraham and the three strangers who come out of the desert to tell them he's, he's going to expect a child and he will be the father of faith. Um, someone pointed out that that's a loose image of the Trinity arriving to give this good news. Um, you can point to other examples, but then it becomes more clear in the New Testament. We have some of that on display in today's readings. The first reading features uh, Moses and God the Father. The second reading features the Holy Spirit. The third reading is of Jesus uh, and also his final instructions to go out and baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So one of those examples where the three names appear together, though with no further explanation about them. Um, but you see the Trinity in action as well in more clear, profound ways in the gospel. For instance, uh, just pointing to the Annunciation. The angel Gabriel appears to Mary speaking a message from God the Father. She is filled with the Spirit and she conceives by the power of the Holy Spirit and what she conceives is the Son. There's the Trinity. Uh, at the birth of Jesus, there are the angels appearing again, speaking on behalf of the Father, led by the Spirit. The shepherds go and see the Son, Trinity. You can see it at his baptism in the Jordan River. A uh, voice calling from heaven saying, this is my son. And the Holy Spirit descends in the form of a dove. And the son is, is standing there in the Jordan River. Um, you can see it all the way through, um, all the way even to the end on the cross where Jesus and the father are speaking. And he lets out his final breath again, that ruah, the spirit, gives up his spirit. Uh, and in the ascension, when he goes to heaven, uh, the words of the Father come again, and the clouds kind of representing the Spirit, and the apostles are told to go back to the upper room to receive the Spirit. So it's threaded through. To be sure, it is divine revelation. It's doctrine. It's been um, codified and clarified in the Council of Nicaea, the Council of Constantinople. It's a part of our creed. Uh, it's the bookends of our liturgy. We start and end with the sign of the cross. So everywhere you turn, there it is. That to me is much less interesting than what I ultimately want to talk with you about, though. So what? <laughs> How does that affect us as a community, knowing that new piece of information, imagining what our worship would look like just knowing God as a creator loosely and as someone who put a loose law on our interior life versus adding now this understanding that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that God is relationship. How does adding that new ingredient change the recipe and how does it impact us? There are a number of ways, but for my homily today, I tried to focus on two main ones. One is the impact on the church as a whole. Um, and I think there are two main ways that um, this doctrine affects our worship. The first one is that we're a sacramental church. We celebrate seven sacraments. Three of those sacraments we call sacraments of initiation. 
they describe how a person is initiated or entered into that church, that sacred community. Now, it's it would be heretical to say one person of the Trinity operates in total isolation of the other two persons. The, I can't any more separate me from my brain and my stomach and my heart than the Trinity can be separated. It's one perfect unity, three persons. Um, but... We could say the spotlight shifts, the, the focus of emphasis shifts from one person to another of the Trinity at certain times. And I have argued that the three sacraments of the Trinity kind of do this. Um, beginning with baptism, the gateway to the other sacraments, the featured person there, I, I think, is God the Father, the head of the family. And we are becoming his adopted sons and daughters through that sacrament. We're becoming brothers and sisters by adoption with Jesus as their elder brother. There is a sense in which we're baptized into Christ. So there, we could also speak of the son in that moment because through him, we enter into the life of the Trinity, which we will more fully experience in heaven. But, but ultimately I would argue that the, the featured person of that sacrament is God the father. Then we shift to uh, confirmation, which is the sacrament of the Holy Spirit, where we're filled with the spirit um, in so many ways that helps us to grow in virtue, that gives us courage to give testimony, that gives us the strength to live this Christian life. And we also receive the Eucharist that sustains us. Uh, in that moment, we are receiving Jesus substantially, body, blood, soul, and divinity. And so we see in that initiation process, we come up close and in person with all three persons of the Trinity, letting us know right from the beginning, from the entry point, that the Trinitarian life is what we're invited to be a part of. That same Trinitarian life impacts us yet further, however, in our behavior, or it should. You know, we should use it perhaps as an examination of conscience. If we pay attention to the words of the liturgy, we notice that the words are guiding us to pray in the Spirit, through the Son, using His words, to the Father. The end focus is God the Father, giving him glory in our worship. And God blesses us through the Son in the Spirit. Uh, his blessings come in return in, in a similar fashion. Um, but the way that I uh, think of it is two, uh, two really critical ways. One, to really understand and accept by faith that when I receive Jesus in the moment I receive the Eucharist, I am more profoundly connected with every other person who receives the Eucharist than I am with my own biological family. We're called to form the body of Christ. That's how it happens. Um, I recently heard someone say Christianity, our faith is a person. I've never heard it quite said like that, but it's true. Christianity is Christ. Jesus is the head. We are the body. But this profound bond of unity, we have to guard against uh, that breaking down. We have to be vigilant about it. Uh, I spoke about it last week when I talked about, you know, the spirit of the world always wanting to creep into our community. Divisions of race, divisions of language, divisions of ethnicity and culture, divisions of politics. In this day and age in our country, it is prevalent everywhere. The one place we want to make sure that it doesn't hold sway is when we gather to worship. And the way it should guide our behaviors, if we notice those kinds of divisions, if we notice discrimination or racism happening or neglect or cliques forming, we have to push back and fight against that. We should act as peacemakers, as bridge builders between groups to make sure that we're doing our part to preserve that unity, that it's not just in that precious moment when we receive, but that it should be ongoing, the reality that marks us as, as a church. We don't always succeed in that, but that has to be the goal. That's part of the reality of believing in a Trinitarian God. And here's the other part. Uh, it's tied to sort of how I view the two hands of the Father, if you will, the Son and the Holy Spirit, as they work in our lives, I think of them in the, in 
the same way I think of m myself. I am two constituent parts. Every human is made up of two constituent parts. We have a material part that is our body, and we have a soul, which is unseen. We can't see it, but we trust that it's there. We have a sense that it's there. Um, in a similar way, the church has a body. The concrete part, you know, we, we go to buildings that have a street address, but it should also be concretely seen in the people that gather. You know, we are never going to be a church that gravitates predominantly toward televangelism. We feel the need to gather physically uh, and to reflect that body in action. It's a sacramental sign to the world. However, we all know that if you have a body and no soul, all you are is a corpse. Um, if, if we receive the Eucharist, but we don't remember to include the Holy Spirit, I'm sad to say we're a corpse. Our faith is kind, can be kind of dead. Uh, and, I, and sadly, I see signs of that often. People who just think that religion is putting in an hour a week, punching the, the time clock, check the box, pick up the bulletin, I did my duty. That's not what our faith calls us to, one hour a week. It, we're supposed to have our lives transformed. And uh, as I said last week, if anything, I view the mass as a war room. That's, that's where we plan to go to battle or my other favorite image is gas station. It's a time for us to restore our energy, to strengthen ourselves for the battle, to strengthen ourselves for the work. And then the second most important words after the consecration are go, you know, to be sent at the end of the mass, to go out to all the world and tell the good news, as Jesus said in today's gospel. That is done through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the soul of the church. And we encounter the Holy Spirit really through that relationship of prayer. Uh, we encounter it sacramentally. Sadly, a lot of adult Catholics never bothered to complete their initiation and receive the sacrament of confirmation, but it has to be a peace. Otherwise, we are uh, a banging gong. We are an empty um, vessel. So, that's Trinitarian, that we're, we have this bond that's formed that we need to protect against its division from the world, but also to remember that our faith is 24-7. It has to continue as we go out into the world. So that's church to me, that the gateway into it is Trinitarian, but also the life, once we're a part of it, is Trinitarian. Our prayer is focused toward the Father, uh, we're united in the Son, in the Eucharist, and we're empowered in the Holy Spirit to bring others. The second dynamic, I think, of the so what question has to do with how we live our life more generally, I guess, I guess you could say more broadly, philosophically, that we're social creatures. If God is relationship, we are called to be in relationship. Uh, Jesus put it very beautifully when he said all of God's law is fulfilled in this. Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. Later, he even further simplified that and said, love one another as I have loved you. But it's relationship, both vertical and horizontal with other people and with God because the image and likeness we've been given is one of relationship. That means our life cannot be a solo mission. Now, there are people who suffer from loneliness. The reason they suffer is because we're not wired to live that way. And I'm, I'm not talking about those who bear that kind of cross. This year during COVID, a number of people have really had a heavy burden on their shoulders of, you know, for health reasons of not being able to have others in their life as much as they need and would like. And I'm not necessarily talking about shy people either, because a person may not speak a lot, but may still love other people. However, uh, I would say if you are a kind of person who generally dislikes other humans, that's a problem. Uh, I First of all, I'm convinced that's a miserable person. But more than that, uh, I think of Nietzsche's famous saying, he concluded that hell is other people. That's the view of the world from an atheist's eyes. If you think hell is other people, if you're a commodity 
grumpy person who sits out on the porch and says, stay off my lawn. <laughs> and is kind of constantly grumbling and scolding against other people. And you imagine the world would be a much better place if it were empty and only had you. I need to pray for you. <laughs> you need to pray for yourself because that's an indication you're not on the right path. Heaven is two things. Heaven in the beatific vision is entering the life of the Trinity from within, experiencing that just as Mary does ahead of us. She's a kind of an icon of the church. She's a Jewish daughter of the Father. She's the mother of the Son, and she's the spouse of the Holy Spirit. She's within the life of the Trinity. We also will experience something like that, but we also will experience a new kind of perfect love with our neighbors. We call it the communion of saints. It's a tight bond. Um, if you think hell is other people, you are not on the road to heaven. We can get a foretaste of heaven by looking at the kind of friendships we form, by being a good friend, by treating other people with kindness and compassion, by serving others instead of just serving ourselves. Those are all signs that we're on the right path. If, on the other hand, we push people out of our life, you can also get a foretaste of hell in this life. If you say my life's a living hell and the hell is other people and I wish people would just leave me alone, it's time to make a major detour. You're not on the right road. Check your GPS. Um, if heaven is a communion of saints, hell is the direct opposite of that. Hell is a disunion of monsters and it's a place of isolation and hatred. It's not a place any of us want to end up. So in addition to kind of showing how the dynamics of the church should look as a healthy church, even more broadly, us as social creatures, I think the doctrine of the Trinity calls us to maybe take some time this week to reflect on how well we're doing as a friend. One of the, the childlike ways we explain evangelization to kids, but certainly could apply to all of us. The easiest way to explain is be a friend, make a friend, bring a friend. That's the building up of the body of Christ. And the, the person we want them to meet ultimately as their friend is Jesus Christ and, and also then enter into the life of Trinity and, and join in this communion. Um, I hope you'll think about that this week. Take a look at how we're living our life Take a reading and see how well we're doing as a friend and as a lover of others. Uh, I hope you have a blessed Memorial Day. If you're traveling, uh, be safe. Enjoy family. Enjoy friends. Celebrate the life of the Trinity in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you.